Members of the Senate and guests will please rise as we receive our distinguished president. Senator, will please come to order. Members and guests will remain standing as we're led in devotion by our chaplain, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. St. John. In Ezekiel, we read, You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, says the Lord God. From Ezekiel 34, verse 31. Join me as we pray, friends. Holy God, as this Senate has yet again returned to this chamber, we are so very much aware that each one of us is counted by you as one of your flock, the sheep of your pasture. And as such, we are so very grateful for your ongoing care, for the blessings you bestow, for the comfort and love you unfailingly grant to us. In the light of these realities, O Lord, graciously give to each of these senators and aides the wisdom and zeal and the integrity they need as they labor here. And may all of their decisions prove to be an illustration of the fact that South Carolina is indeed a state blessed with shepherds who absolutely care for each and every individual. We so pray, O oh Lord, in your blessed and holy name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Senator from Lexington, Senator Sessler, what point of a quorum? Senator from Lexington, questions of quorum. Clerk will count. Twenty-six members are present. A quorum is present. Are there any petitions, memorials, presentments of grand jury, or such like paper? Clerk will read. Message from the governor, Mr. President, members of the Senate. I'm transmitting here with the following appointments for confirmation. These appointments are made with the advice and consent of the Senate. Therefore, submitted for your consideration. Statewide appointment, Secretary, Department of Commerce, Mr. Harry M. Lightsey III of Columbia. to the Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee. Senator from Oconee, what purpose do you rise? If I could. You're recognized, sir. Let me get some order. Let me, let me come. Senator, please come to order. We will not proceed until you do. Senator from Oconee is recognized. The members of the Senate just read across was the governor's nomination for the Secretary of Commerce, Mr. Harry Lightsey III. Mr. Lightsey is here with us today. He will be out in the antechamber and around and would encourage you as you have time to have the opportunity to, to speak with him. Uh, it's been referred to Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee. Uh, and, and once the um, clerk and those have done the work that's necessary, then we'll be uh, looking to have a committee meeting of the Labor, Commerce, and Industry Committee at the appropriate time. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. Clerk will read. Statewide appointment, member of the Department of Transportation Commission, Mr. Bill B. Dukes of Chapin. Refer to the Transportation Committee. Yes. We have no further communications that were on the introduction of new bills and resolutions. The desk is clear. Senator from Lexington is recognized. What purpose do you rise, Senator? Senator from Lexington. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, you ready? Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, I've been asked by the Chairman to come before you this morning on behalf of the Conference Committee.
We have and are bringing to you this morning four separate provisos which were not in the Senate version of the budget. This is at the House's request relative to these four provisos. I think they are generally something that will not create a problem for you, uh, but we'll go through them, and it requires a three-fifths vote of this Senate to include them in the conference report, uh, and the motion to approve and include is not debatable as I understand the rules of the Senate. The first is proviso number 34.63. This proviso extends any Department of Health and Environmental Control issued dock construction permit from January 1, 2020 to July 1, to June 30 of 22, 2022 for the purpose of people who were not able to complete their dock permits because of COVID-19 and because of the supply chain problem that's occurred. That is the two reasons that your conferees would come to you today and ask you to vote to include this in the conference report. If there's no questions, Mr. President, I would move for a three-fifths vote. Senator Sparnberg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? Yes, sir. He will. There will be two votes, correct? The first vote will be a vote to take up that proviso, and the second vote would be whether to adopt it, correct? No, sir. It's just one vote. To con this is where we are. We are making the motion as the conferees. The question is, shall the proviso be included in the conference report? Senator from Pickens. Senator Rice, what purpose do you rise? Yes, sir. I just want to clarify, this is on that one proviso, that not is, on all four. We're going to take each one of them separately. Correct. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Next, Mr. President, Senator is... Lexington. Mr. President, next is 108.13. I will tell you that my information in the Greenville delegation is here that this proviso originated on behalf of the Greenville water system. Uh, and this proviso in essence says that an entity that is a part of the state retirement system can choose by July 1 to pay the employee and employer portion of their retirement system that goes to the retirement system. This proviso is being requested by them as we understand it because of trying to retain employees and in fact being unable to recruit employees and in essence, in simple terms, it allows them to give an employee a pay raise. I mean, there's no secret to what it allows to occur. Um, this proviso is applicable to any state entity that is a part of the South Carolina retirement system. So you need to understand that. And if I recall, in all fairness to this Senate, the Senate from Edgefield is standing, this proviso was in the Senate version of the bill and was ruled out of order as a rule 24 upon the motion of the Senate, or point of order raised by the Senator from Edgefield, as I recall. Senator from Edgefield, Senator Massey, what purpose do you rise? Yield for some questions? You will. As long as they're easy, yes, sir. Well, this be, um, I'm not going to guarantee that, um, assuming I'm capable of asking a hard one. I don't know. But, well, first of all, this... This proviso isn't limited to the South Carolina retirement system. That's is what it? I said. It applies. It, but it's the, not just limited to SCRS. It oh, yes, and the police officer's retirement system. Right. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Do you know why the Greenville Water System would care about the police officer's retirement system? No, sir. I have no idea. All right. So Maybe one of the senators from Greenville can. I think it's just the way it was drafted, Senator. Well, Senator, one of the concerns that I had early on was, and the reason I, one of the reasons that I raised the point of order, one of the reasons I raised the point of order was that it was clearly amended in permanent law. No but, but the second, 
or an, another reason was I waited a little while to raise the point, but there was no discussion about it. And um, I mean, there was never any argument given as to why we ought to do this, other than I mean, it's clearly intended to help retention. Um, but I'm curious, was there any discussion about this at the Finance Committee when the Finance Committee was taking up the budget initially? It doesn't fall within my section of, or my subcommittee. I don't recall much discussion, if any, at that point in time. Senator from Oconee may can address that, but I don't recall, or Senator from Dorchester, who has been involved in retirement issues a great deal. All right. Senator, you've been, and, and I'm actually glad that you're up there because you've been involved. I was drafted. I didn't volunteer, I Senator. Understand, I understand how that works. But, but you've been, the reason I said that I'm glad that you're the one answering questions is, is that you've been very involved in the retirement system changes that the General Assembly has made over the last 10 years. Correct. Haven't you? Um, and, and I know there were a number of years when everyone understood that there were going to have to be changes made in the system, but it was a hard nut to crack. Correct. But in, I think it was 2012, we made um, the, the first significant movement to try to address some of those issues. And, and I, I believe that you and the Senator from Oconee and the former Senator from Aiken were very involved in that reform effort. Does that sound right? That's correct. All right, now, as well as the son from Dorchester. Well, he oh, wasn't here in 2000. He was elected oh, okay. in 2000. This is before yeah. him, yeah. I think. Now, in the subsequent attempts, I think the Senator from Dorchester has been very involved. But the Correct. first, the first attempt that I remember uh, when we passed legislation would have been in 2012, an election year, because I remember the former Senator from Aiken, Senator Ryberg, being very involved in that effort. Correct. Is that, okay. Um, and I remember one of the things that we did in that legislation was to increase contribution amounts, but that legislation also coupled the employer and the employee contributions such that if one increased, the other one would have to increase by the same amount. Do you remember that? I do. And I, I Senator, I, I remember former Senator Ryberg talking about the importance of that because he said, if we don't do that, I anticipate other increases are going to have to come. If we don't couple them, what the legislature will do is it will bow to pressure and it will make the contributions solely employer and not employee. Do you remember conversations about that? I remember some of that discussion, yes, sir. All right. Now, later on, um, I don't know, three or four years ago, the Senate passed another measure to try to help the retirement systems. This one was also focused on SCRS and PORS. Correct. That, that effort decoupled employer and employee, and it increased contribution rates. Do you remember that? I do. To the point that, and maybe the senator from Dorchester may have to help me on this one, but I believe for, for the police officer's retirement system, the total contribution, and we're phasing this in, but the total contribution, employer, ver employer and employee combined, was going to be over 30% of the total salary, if I'm right. And the, and the SCRS total contribution amount was going to be right at 30, maybe just under 30%. Yeah, it was, so there was a recognition here, wasn't there, that we needed to put more money into the system. Correct. And we were doing that by requiring the employees to pay, but also the employers, the state, to contribute more in that effort, right? Both had to contribute more. But the employer, the employer portion increased by a larger amount, and even with the phase-ins, the employer provision, the employer contributions were going to increase by a larger amount than the employee contributions. Does that sound familiar? The employer, correct. Right, the employer contributions would increase at a larger amount than the employee contributions. Right, and during this, all this discussion you're talking about, everything you said is correct. I've always had a concern about the 9% that the employees are paying, particularly now after the impact of COVID, but that's 
I understand, I'm, and I'm, I'm waiting gonna, on your question. Well, I'm leading up because I think that there are there are a lot of people I think who are in here who do not have the benefit of that history. I agree. Um, and in this effort that we passed that we were just talking about, the one that was maybe four years ago or so, that was billed as phase one of a two-phase approach. Wasn't it? Correct. Phase one was the injection of money. Phase two was more of a reform of the whole system, if I remember correctly. Does that, does that sound right? All right. Now, Senator, what this would do is it would allow any employer in the state retirement system, which is for everybody who may not, that's the big one, right? So the state retirement system that includes, includes any state agency. Includes state agencies. It includes a lot of local government Correct. facilities because most county governments and municipalities, as far as I know, are in the SCRS. SCRS also includes all teachers, doesn't it? So SCRS is the big one. FORS includes police officers and I think magistrates may be in that system. Um, they're not, well, there's, anyway, PORS is a smaller system, but it also had some issues we had to address. All right. What this proviso would do, if I understand correctly, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but, but isn't it true that what this proviso would do is it would allow any entity in the state retirement, the South Carolina retirement system or the police officer's retirement system to pay 100% of the contribution requirement? I would probably say it a little differently. What you said is it requires it. What, it. what it does is it gives to that entity the option before July 1 to make a choice for all their employees. If they got 7,000 employees, they got to cover them all. If they got 10, they got to cover them all. That they can pay the employee and the employee contribution for next fiscal year. It's only a one year proviso and the decision would have to be made the following year. But yes, other than saying it requires, that is exactly what the proviso is. If does. I said requires, I apologize. I, yeah. It allows those entities that, that fall under these two systems to make correct. that decision. Correct. And that decision would be to pay 100% of the contribution rate for their employees. Right. So, so then that means that the employees would not be paying anything towards their pension program. That is correct. All right. Um, the net effect of that would be that the employee would get a 9% pay increase, but also a 100% taxpayer funded pension program. For that year. Yes, and, and I understand it's a proviso. Right. But I've also been, been here long enough to understand what happens when a proviso goes into the budget. I mean, of the provisos that were in there in the previous budget, probably 98% of them are in there in this budget, aren't they? Probably so, sure. That may even be an underestimate. I mean, when these things go in, they're very difficult to pull out. Is that fair? I don't know I agree with that statement, but yes, a lot of times they stay in. It would be a fair statement. Uh, all right. So. I understand the desire, I mean, I understand why you would want to do this in order to try to retain employees or maybe even recruit employees. Why, is there another reason that you know of that, that we should do this? That's what I understand they are asking for, for is retention and recruitment okay. of employees center is what I was told. I mean, that would, that would, Senator, you know, that would entice me. I mean, if I were getting a 9% pay increase and then a completely taxpayer funded pension program, that would, sure. that would entice me too. Um, so I, I understand how it might work. Why not, why not just pay them more? Pay the employees more. Senator, I think they could. Keep in mind that you asking somebody, I didn't ask for this proviso. You've been drafted to explain it. I yeah, understand. It, the, the Senate rejected it under Rule 24. The House is a part of the negotiations on the conference report. Asked the chairman 
and the conferees to bring back these four provisos and see if we could get a three-fifths vote to do that. That's, and that's what we're doing because the votes have to occur prior to yeah. taking up the conference report. And sure. When I was asked yesterday afternoon to do this, I specifically got on the phone with some various staff members as well as this morning talking to the head of the of the retirement system to be sure I understood what it did. Right, and so I, I guess, and I understand you've been drafted, and I understand it was a recent drafting. Um, We're all in it together, Senator. I, they I, don't I, bother me in the least. I'm sure, glad to I, do it. I understand. Um, I'm curious, though, why, if the if if we think we can help retain or recruit employees with a nine percent pay increase. Why don't we just pay them 9% more? I mean, even if that requires us putting more money into the budget to do that, well, why don't we try paying the employees more as opposed to tinkering with the retirement system? Yeah. Do you have any idea about that? Well, I can tell you what one person I called told me was their balance sheet would look the same because they already got the money there. They're just shifting it up, and they're giving a pay raise without having to get more money. Now, that was what one person explained it to me as. Yeah, from their perspective, from the employer's perspective, it may not make a big deal. I mean, I, Senator, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the retirement system anyway. I'm concerned that we've carved out little provisions here and there, and I understand why we've done it, to allow for some critical needs folks to come back to work. I understand. But, but I'm concerned about the effect this may have, Senator, because... While it's a one-year proviso, there's going to be isn't there, there's going to be pressure to retain this type of an incentive, isn't there? I would anticipate there would be, Senator. And once, I, think, I think there's a bigger danger than that that gave me some concern before I got up here that I got myself comfortable with to some degree before I got up here. Well, in and you may know of, or have thought of dangers that I hadn't thought of, but, but in addition, in addition to, to the one that I just articulated, isn't it also likely that while this may, it may have been intended for one small entity in Greenville County, it's open to everybody in these two systems. I think we agreed on that, right? It is open to, to everybody, everybody in the SCRS and PORS. It is open to everybody and in particular to any state agency. That's right. So you could very well have this expand well beyond Greenville County. Yeah, and I would say if a state agency went in and did this, I believe they would have a hard road to hoe the next year on their personal services line when they went to get funding without... So I think there is a backdoor safety net from that regard. Well, sure, they're going to, once they do it for the next year, they're going to ask for more money in order to, to, to fill that in. I get, I get that. But it's also, I mean, this is going to have, have an effect of, you get one agency that does it and one of them that doesn't. I mean, there's going to be, I mean, look, I don't want another situation like what we just saw because of some incompetent leadership at DJJ where you get employees walking out. But this puts some employees and some agencies in a position of having some negotiations with their agency leadership, doesn't it? It, it could. But and I would tell you this budget addresses retention in many cases of key employees and retention of state employees because of the problems we have. Yeah, well, I don't, you know, I, th I think, I mean, t to that point, um, and I don't want to get the senator from Lexington behind me stirred up, but, but I think dumping more money into that problem is a way to cover for poor leadership because you don't, you don't, either you don't have any ideas on how to address it or you're unwilling to address it. But, but in any event, even the people at state agencies who would be eligible for this scenario, they're also getting a pay increase, aren't they, in the budget? Whether you're a teacher or you're a state yeah. agency employee? Yeah. Yes, they're, they're getting they're a pay increase. increase. That's correct. Um, Senator, I, I'm... I mean, I, I know you've picked this up by now, but I'm, I'm very concerned about 
tinkering with the retirement system like this because I'm concerned that once you start it, it's going to be very difficult to stop it. And if you get a number of agencies who this year decide to exercise this provision, or you get law enforcement agencies who decide to exercise this provision, I don't know, I don't know that the legislature has the spine to say no to the employees who are going to want it next year too and the year after that. Once you start something like this, once you start giving somebody a 100% taxpayer-funded pension program, that then they can leave, isn't it true, Senator? They could leave employment and they still get it. That's correct. Right. And Senator, I keep looking behind you and around because I told you we were told this was being requested by the Greenville Water System to see if any member of the Greenville delegation wants to answer some of the questions you're raising relative to that. Well, and, and, and maybe, there, maybe there could be something that, that I could hear from Greenville that would be persuasive on this. I, I, but, but, but Your but interpretation I'm, of the proviso is correct. Okay. And, In my opinion. And, and, and I In appreciate that. And so what I'm trying to do well, what I'm trying to do with this line of questioning is I'm really, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, certainly. Well, I'm not worried about But what that. I'm trying to do is to, and really a little bit of thinking out loud, but trying to explore the potential consequences of doing this. Because I understand the idea of, hey, we need, we need some help in recruiting or we need some help in retaining. My guess is that could apply to every school district and every state agency that's out there, every law enforcement agency. My concern is, though, and I understand it's a one-year proviso. I also understand how one-year provisos turn into decades-long provisos, but my concern is that once you start this, that it's going to be very, very difficult for a representative body, after hearing from employees, after hearing from teachers, say, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. Senator, I think you've got the Senator from Greenville standing behind you that you okay. haven't seen. Well, and, 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 I am, and I am concerned about that, and, and I... And I don't know that you've got, maybe you've got a response on that about how we, if this, if this expands beyond just Greenville County, I mean, if it's confined to Greenville County, I still don't like it, but it's easier to control. But if it's not confined to Greenville County, if we start having some school districts, which is where I would expect it to happen, if you start having some school districts in an attempt to, to recruit teachers or to retain teachers, if they want to use some of their federal money to help give a salary boost, which I think the federal rules, as best I know, would allow that, and then if, if they were to do that, how then do we say no to extending it the next year? Because my, my concern is it's going to be a whole lot bigger than Greenville, and it's going to, and, and, and it's going to, it's going to really, this changes but this changes the deal Senator, on the retirement Senator, system. Senator from Edgefield, keep in mind the conferees were asked by the House to bring these four provisos, and that's what we're doing. We made no guarantees that those provisos, and had no ability to make a guarantee, those provisos would pass or get the required three-fifths vote. Are the conferees advocating for the three-fifths vote? I think the conferees would ask for a three-fifths vote because it was a part of the conference discussion. Okay. Well, if the conferees are asking for it, then let I feel me, better about me, asking questions. Let me preface that by saying I can't speak from the, for the chairman of Senate Finance. Well, uh, if the, he may want to address that issue, but if, I if think the, that's the position. If the chairman of Senate Finance weren't going to ask for it, it wouldn't be on the floor today, would it? That's correct. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, Senator, look, I'm, I'm willing to sit down at least for a minute and listen to some other questions. Maybe it'll make me feel better, but I'm, I'm really concerned about changing the deal. Senator, on, I understand your concern. And, it and, is and, not limited. It is open to any entity which is a member of the system. I'm, yeah. never, I'm never going to intentionally mislead this body. Well, and I don't... I, I would never suggest that you would, because right. I, think, I think many times, Senator, I think you'll tell us the truth even if it's not in your benefit. Right. Um, but, and, I, and I, again, I appreciate you being the one to, to make the explanation because you've got a lot of the history on some of the changes that we've, we've made. we got another in, one coming behind this one. So. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I've read that one too. This one concerns me more, though. I understand. But, um, 
that this one uh, putting creating a system where you're going to have a hundred percent taxpayer funded pension program that gives me I, mean, I don't like that just right off the bat but allowing it to be something that could expand to all of state government all of education every local every municipal and county law enforcement agency that concerns me too because i think they're going to be pressured into doing this in in order to retain and recruit and once it starts i don't know that we've got the backbone to stop it that's my concern i heard you Thank Senator you. from Greenville, Senator Turner, what purpose do you rise? Uh, see if the Senator will yield. Yes, sir. For a question. Thank you uh, for up there taking all these questions <laughs> on behalf of the Greenville Water System, I think. Um, uh, I'm not up to make a persuasive argument like uh, I think the Senator from Edgefield would like for me to make, but at the same time, hopefully shed a little light because I know we've had the discussions together plenty of times about government employees not making enough money now, now the retirement system, basically they're, they're to get 9% out, at least on the Greenville water system I know, uh, for the retirement system, plus their 5% FICA, so almost 15.5% kind of goes toward retirement already. This is no different than anywhere else. It's easy to say, well, let's raise, the, let's raise their salaries. Well, the problem is there's a lot of people that have been there 15, 20 years, everything and all of a sudden you've got internal pay equity issues. They are not looking from what I understand to pay 100% of the employee contribution, only a certain portion of it, maybe up to 3% of what the employee is contributing. They still understand the employee has to have skin in the game regardless. At the same time, this is nothing other than pointing out that somebody is trying to look for a solution, did you know, to the fact that our retirement system is hurting us in keeping and retaining the best employees to carry out the state business, local business, and everything else. And this to me, did you know, is just somebody trying to figure out how they can address it locally. If it helps other people, it helps other people. Yeah, Senator from Greenville, I think the point that Senator from Edgefield's making is you're explaining and the proviso was supposedly take care of a Greenville water system and they may only pay a portion of it, but the other entities can pay it all if they choose. And so I think that's the point he's making. And I, I think the proviso speaks for itself uh, from that standpoint. Thank you. Sent from Charleston, sent to Campson, what purpose do you have? Would the speaker you? Yes, sir. No question. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, Senator, I'm listening to this, this conversation and um, I appreciate your engagement in it. I know this is not your proposal. You're, right. you're representing, presenting it on behalf of the conferees. But I do have this question. Um, if you look in the private sector, there's, this is, this is presented as a retention problem for a public utility. If you look in the private sector, we're experiencing massive retention problems. I mean, un never before experienced retention problems and not just retention, but bringing employees back to work after the whole COVID shutdown. And, and could this just be part of that larger dynamic that is, that has resulted in Actually, people, a lot of people got paid more to not work than to work during COVID. And that dynamic has, has resulted in la dropping out of the workforce, lowering the workforce participation rate. So how much of this is a systemic issue re related to that, that everyone, every state agency perhaps, and every, gut, every private uh, company perhaps, Many of them, anyway, have been um, experiencing. So, can this really be distinguished from this larger systemic problem that the private sector and the public sector has experienced in the wake of COVID? I, I do think both are experiencing it, Senator. I think you're correct. Thank you. Question is Shall the proviso be included in the conference report, Senator? Roll call has been requested. Sent from Darlington, what purpose do you rise? Uh, 
Mr. Mr. President, I move that the proviso be included in the appropriations conference report. Roll call. Been requested. Thank you, sir. Take a three fifths vote. Clerk will ring the bell. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Kimbrell, what purpose do you rise? Uh, unanimous consent request, Mr. President. State your request, sir. Or leave from the Senator for York, Senator Johnson, for the remainder of the day. Ms. Jackson, in none so order. Any other unanimous consent request? Senator from Pickens, what purpose do you rise? Or leave for the Senator from Charleston, Senator Sin, for the day. Ms. Jackson, in none so order. Any other request? Reading clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams. No. Mr. Alexander? Aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Campson? No. Mr. Cash? No. Mr. Clemmer? No. Mr. Corbin? Not voting Mr. Cromer. Mr. Cromer not voting Mr. Davis? No. Mr. Fanning? Aye. Mr. Gamble, aye. Mr. Garrett, not voting Mr. Goldfinch, aye. Mr. Grooms, not voting Mrs. Gustafson, no. Mr. Harpootlian, aye. Mr. Hembry, no. Mr. Hutto, aye. Mr. Jackson, aye. Mr. Kevin Johnson, not voting Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell? No. no. Mr. Kempson? Aye. Mr. Leatherman? Aye. Uh -huh. Mr. Loftus? Not voting Mr. Malloy? No. Mr. Martin? No. Mr. Massey? No. Mrs. Matthews? Aye. Mr. McElveen? Aye. Mr. McLeod? Aye. Mr. Peeler? No. no. Mr. Rankin? Aye. Mr. Rice? No. Mr. Saab? Aye. Mr. Scott? Not voting Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Setzler? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Sheely? Not voting Mr. Stevens? Aye. Mr. Talley? Aye. Mr. Turner? Aye. Mr. Verdon? No. Mr. Williams? Aye. Mr. Young? No. Senator Cromer votes no. All senators have voted. Senator Scott votes aye. Senator Kevin Johnson votes aye. Senator Garrett votes no. Senator Grooms votes no. Senator Sheely votes no. Senator Bennett votes no. All senators have voted. Senator Corbin votes abstain. Last call of all senators voted. Senator from La Senator Loftus abstains. This is it. Polls will close. Clerk will tabulate. By vote of 22 to 20, the motion fails. Mr. President, the next proviso is 108.14. This again deals with the retirement system. Let me get some water. Then please I come over. This, I think, I may be surprised, I think this will be a lot easier. This proviso is being sought on behalf of the MUSC Hospital Authority. State agencies, as I understand it from Ms. Boykin this morning, have the ability when there was a furlough, particularly related to COVID, to pay the employer-employee contributions for that furlough period so that there's not a break in service. And that's all this allows to do is to protect those employees so that there's not a break in service 
in their employment. Senator from New Bay, Senator Cromer, what comes to you? Authority is a non-state agency. The, the hospital, the hospital is not covered, but MUSC employees are covered. So this would just give the authority the same ability. Senator from New Bay, what purpose do you ask? It's yes. Senator would yield for question. Yes, hey, yes. Senator, this, this is quick, short. Uh, this one's a lot easier. This one is specific to COVID, so therefore it can't be one of those lingering on for 10 more years or so. So this yes. should be a fairly easy one, correct? Correct. I don't think, I may be wrong, I don't think there's a major opposition to this. Senator Mulconey, what purpose do you rise? Thank you, Senator. Senator, yield for a question. Yes, sir. He will. So don't you agree that I believe this was in the CARES Act last year because we had that, and then also back in 2008 to 2010 when agencies were having to furlough folks, this is consistent with that policy to make sure that we did not punish them from that standpoint? Correct. The question the is. I move that the, this proviso uh, 108.14 be included in the conference report. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Last one, Mr. President, members Mr. of the Senate is 109.15. Again, this is a relatively simple proviso. The current tax credit for property used in the distribution and dispensing of renewal fuel uh, it is what it deals with. It's equal to 25% of the cost of purchasing, constructing, and installing the property. The tax credit states that the taxpayer must place the property or facility in service prior to January 1, 2020. Because of COVID, this would extend it to January 1, 2022. The physical impact is a total of $32,000. $32,000 only if the, yes, sir. Senator from Spartanburg, Senator Martin, what purpose do you rise? To see if the Senator from Lexington would yield for a question. Yes, will. Senator, where did this proviso arise? It was in the House version of the Appropriations Bill. And it came over in the Senate. Was it not adopted or was it considered it a Rule 24 House, violation? It's in House 2, Senator, as I recall, Senator from Spartanburg. I don't recall it being in House 1. It was not in House 1, it was in House 2. Again, the fiscal impact is thirty-six thousand dollars. But if this had come into the Senate version, it would more than likely—is this already existing law? It is an existing tax credit. All this does is extend it to 2022 because of COVID and, and the supply chain. It's the same exact thing we did on the first one. Right, but if this, well, if this was done in the budget it would be a Rule 24 because it would be an amendment of permanent law, correct? That is exactly the reason we're here doing this, because okay. it would, right. if the point was raised and the president ruled it was a Rule 24, it would be a Rule 24. But I don't but have that opportunity in this position. Says, I only have a position to vote no. So that is correct. I'm, I'd like to have a vote, a roll call vote at the appropriate time. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. President, if there are no further Questions I moved to include 109.15 proviso in the conference report on the state appropriations bill. All calls been requested. Clerk will ring the bell. Meeting clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams, aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Mr. Allen, Aye. Mr. Bennett? Aye. Mr. Campson? Aye. Mr. Cash? Not voting Mr. Clymer? Aye. Mr. Corbin? Not voting Mr. Cromer? Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Fanning? Aye. Mr. Gambrell? Aye. Mr. Garrett? Aye. Mr. Goldfinch? Aye. Mr. Grooms? Aye. Mrs. Gustafson. Not voting Mr. Harputlian. Not voting Mr. Hembry. Mr. Hembry not voting Mr. Hutto. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell. Mr. Kimbrell not voting Mr. Kempson. Aye. Mr. Leatherman. Mr. Leatherman votes aye. Mr. Loftus. Mr. Loftus not voting, Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Mr. Martin votes no, Mr. Massey. Aye. 
Mrs. Matthews. Aye. Mr. McElveen. Aye. Mr. McLeod. Aye. Mr. Peeler. Aye. Aye. Mr. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Saab. Votes aye. Mr. Scott. Votes aye. Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Sexler. Aye. Aye. Mrs. Sheely. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Talley. Aye. Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner not vote. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Verdon. Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. All senators have voted. Senator Corbin votes <coughs> no. Senator Kimbrell votes aye. Senator Cash votes aye. Senator Gustafson votes aye. Senator Loftus votes aye. All senators have voted. Proposal closed. Clerk will tabulate. I vote of 39 to 3. The motion is adopted. Mr. President. Senator from Lexington. Uh, while the chairman of Senate Finance conveys to the House conferees the action of the South Carolina Senate relative to these four provisos being included in this state appropriation bill, I would ask Senator from Richland or other senators, and you allow me to make a, have a resolution of congratulatory resolution read. Mr. Objection. He announced an order. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. ladies and gentlemen of the Senate, uh, in the ante room, it stands Reverend Charles Jackson of Brookland Baptist Church in West Columbia, South Carolina, my dear friend for over probably 50 years. For those of you who don't know Reverend Jackson, he is celebrating his 50th anniversary as a pastor. He began preaching at nine years of age, was ordained at 12, and came to, became the pastor of Brooklyn and Baptist at 18 years of age. He is married to Robin, who is very active in our community and a wonderful, wonderful lady, and has two children. Pastor Jackson has been a friend of mine, as I said, for 50 years. He is a man who actually has more energy probably than just about anybody I ever have met in my life. And if you give him an idea, you better be ready to be run over to implement the idea that you give him because once he gets a hold of it, he never turns loose of it. To visit Brooklyn Baptist is an incredible experience and one that my and my family have been blessed to worship with them on numerous occasions. He happens to know that Amazing Grace is my favorite song, and when I'm there, thanks to him, the choir sings Amazing Grace. He was a personal prayer warrior for me in 2011 when I went through my health issue, and it is my honor to have this resolution along with Senator Jackson read by the clerk of the, uh, the reading clerk, and then we'll present it to him and call on Senator Jackson for comments. But I would just say that we thank God for Reverend Charles Jackson, for his ministry at Brooklyn Baptist, for his family, his wife and family, and all that he has done and Reverend Jackson, we wish you another 50 years of doing what you're doing. I would ask the clerk, and you want to speak before he reads it or after? Go ahead. Senator Richardson, Senator Jackson. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I will be brief. Pastor Charles Jackson is one of my dearest friends. He is my mentor. He is my big brother. He and I both went to Benedict College. In fact, I followed him uh, there. Uh, we both are pastoring. And oftentimes people get the Jacksons mixed up. But I tell them, please don't get us mixed up. I say that is like getting Michael Jordan mixed up with some other third string basketball player. <laughs> okay. um, he is a phenomenal leader. Over the last year and a half, he and I have become even closer, if that is possible, because we both, the saying goes, misery loves company. Both of our congregations were out of worship 
for over 18 months, virtual only. And he and I would talk every week. Uh, we planned our re-entry at the same time. We exited at the same time. Uh, and so he has been a dear, dear, close friend, and I am so proud of him. In fact, I said to him that he has actually literally messed me up. He's been pastoring 50 years, looked great, and I don't plan to be there half that long <laughs> and had already planned my exit until my board said to me, if Pastor Jackson can be there 50 years and look that good, you would never look that good, but you can be here a little longer. So uh, I am unfortunately now being forced to stay longer than I had planned to be a pastor, but God bless him. It is a awesome job and a responsibility. We often talk about hundreds, literally, this is true. This man does hundreds of funerals a year, per year, on top of doing over 100 preaching engagements every year, twice every Sunday, sometimes three times a Sunday, on 100 funerals and a weekly Bible study that he does, and he still looks that great. Congratulations, my friend. Brother from Darlington, you said you'd like to make a comment? From Darlington, Central Bloy. Thank you, Mr. President. Members of the Senate, I rise too to um, congratulate my friend, Reverend Charles Jackson. We have a little bit of a different history. Um, uh, I've been knowing him for my length of time in Columbia, which is about 40 years. And um, I remember when I was in law school, um, living over in the Casey community, uh, Reverend Jackson and I would go and play pickup basketball together over at the Casey Community Center, I think it was. And um, Reverend Jackson has been a, a mentor and friend for many years. He's passed it on. Um, he, he has led in his discipleship with many other pastors and his deacon board and others that he has um, planted the seeds all over. He has done it with his um, children. His son is a great pastor as well. His wife is a beautiful person. His daughter, we all know from working around here and everybody that's um, a part of his family. But in, but in light of everything else that he has done, I just say, I just say this, that he takes the time. Um, there are many times when people are, are, in, are in difficult situations. Um, I know people that may need a scripture or something, they'll call Reverend Jackson. Whenever they need to do something before a funeral, they'll end up calling Reverend Jackson. When children are having problems, he takes time to end up mentoring them. And with all of the, the, um, the large congregations that he has to end up preaching to, I know that whenever I call him, he comes down to my little church, which is about 150 people, and he spends the whole week um, sitting down, going out to eat in, in, um, in little restaurants, um, spending time over in Hartsfield. And he says, I just love coming to Hartsfield, and sometimes he'll drive back and forth. And i just tell you, tell you this, is that um, um, the, the greatest thing that we can do in our lives is, 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 is to be able to serve. That's the most pervasive question. And I think that whenever we um, talk about preachers here in South Carolina, obviously you are wherever you are. But where I am, I think of a, a preacher, my, my pastor that's not my pastor of my church, is Reverend Charles Jackson. Thank you. Hey, Mr. President, we would ask the clerk to read the resolution. Without objection, the clerk will read. It's a Senate resolution to congratulate Dr. Charles B. Jackson, Sr., upon the occasion of his 50th anniversary as pastor of Brooklyn Baptist Church and to commend him for his many years of service to his congregation in the West Columbia community. Whereas the members of the South Carolina Senate are pleased to recognize Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr. upon the occasion of his 50th pastoral anniversary on February 7th, 2021. Whereas a native of West Columbia, Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr. was born on July 16, 1952 to the late Mr. Thomas and Mrs. Eliza Rump Jackson. Whereas Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr.'s alumnus of Benedict College, where he graduated, graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Science, Morehouse School of Religion of the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, where he graduated with honors with a Master's of Divinity, Columbia International University, where he earned a Doctor's of Divinity, University of South Carolina, where he earned a Doctor of Public Service, also received an honorary Doctor of Divinity from Morris College and Benedict College. Whereas Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr. began preaching at the age of nine and was licensed at the age of 10, was ordained at the age of 12, and became pastor of Brooklyn Baptist Church at the age of 18. 
Whereas under his leadership, Brooklyn Baptist Church has grown to include over 60 ministries, over 190 employees, a full-service federal credit union, the Brooklyn Foundation, the Brooklyn Center for Community Economic Change, the Brooklyn West Columbia Community Housing Development Corporation, the Brooklyn Community Pediatric Center with Eau Claire Cooperative, and the Brooklyn Lakeview Empowerment Center, which was recently sealed as the first historically segregated African-American school to receive a state marker in Lexington County. Whereas over the years, Dr. Jackson has led the church into a new sanctuary that seats 2,300 and into a 6,800 square foot community resource center consists of an academic child development center, a health and wellness center, and a banquet and conference center. Church has also opened a second location in the northeast part of Columbia and completed a Christian learning center which holds its youth and teen center. Whereas as a leader of his congregation and community, Dr. Jackson has mentored and trained 18 sons, one daughter, and a total of 77 ministers. Whereas Dr. Jackson is married to Robin H. Jackson, has two children and six grandchildren. Whereas the members of the South Carolina Senate greatly appreciate the ministry of Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr. and his service to Brooklyn Baptist Church and the West Columbia community. Now therefore, be it resolved by the Senate, the members of the South Carolina Senate by this resolution congratulate Dr. Charles B. Jackson Sr. upon the occasion of his 50th anniversary as pastor of Brooklyn Baptist Church and commend him for his many years of service to his congregation and the West Columbia community. Resolutions adopted. Dr. Jackson, Charles Jackson has with him today, Pastor Jackson has his grandson with him today. Pastor Jackson, again, on behalf of the people of South Carolina, thank you for your ministry, and we thank God for giving you to us and our community. Please join me in congratulating him on 50 years as a pastor. Congratulations, Dr. Jackson. Sent from Florence, what purpose do you rise? You recognize, sir. Senator from Florence. Brother, thank you. Uh, very brief remarks, and then after that, a resolution will be read. You know, before us today on our desk, we have a document over 500 pages that be in the state appropriation bill. You know, as I do, this does not create itself. It's got to have somebody to do it for us, and I certainly am not capable. But uh, we always rely on our amazing staff to uh, make our real ideas reality. And no one, no one has done more than Deborah Duncan over the last 40 years. I let the resolution speak to Deborah's story uh, career, but I'd like to say from my heart, Deborah, thank you for what you've done for me as finance chair, the Senate, and the state of South Carolina. You will be missed as a profession and a friend, and while you will not be with us moving forward, you will not be forgotten. I say to you, congratulations on your well-earned retirement, and more importantly, and I want the Senate to understand this, <clears throat> Deborah has eight voyages already booked on one of those big ships out there, so she's going to have a great time when she leaves us here. Again, Deborah, thank you, and congratulations, and President, if the clerk will read the uh, resolution. Clerk will read the resolution. This is a concurrent resolution to congratulate Deborah Ann Duncan upon the occasion of her retirement after more than four decades of outstanding service and to wish her continued success and happiness in all her future endeavors. Whereas it is altogether fitting and proper that the members of the South Carolina General Assembly should pause in their deliberations to express their gratitude to Deborah Duncan, Senior Proviso Coordinator for the South Carolina Legislative Council, for her significant contributions to the General Assembly. 
Whereas Deborah hails from Sanford, Florida, where she returns regularly to visit her numerous friends and family. Whereas she attended Florida State University, and while she may may be a Seminole, Deborah has become an avid Gamecock fan and enjoys watching all University of South Carolina athletics. Whereas Deborah began her career in state government as a temporary employee for the Budget Control Board's state's planning office and enjoyed being able to set her own hours. Soon thereafter, in 1979, she was persuaded to become a full-time become a full-time employee, and after she was merged into the budget division, she served as the administrative assistant to the budget director. Whereas she served as state budget analyst for the Budget Control Board, State Auditor's Office, Procurement Review Board, and others. Whereas Deborah's perfection of the proviso process over the years has earned her nickname as the proviso queen and proviso logist. And even some refer to her jokingly as code commissioner of temporary law. Whereas her expertise, however, extends beyond provisos to the budget process as a whole. She's always been willing to stay late long after others have left to ensure that deadlines are met. Whereas the members of both chambers and staff of legislative council regard Deborah as someone on whom they can always depend for help because she sincerely wants everyone to be successful, the members, the staff, and the agencies alike. Whereas while her abundant knowledge regarding the budget process will be, greatly, will be a great loss, she has worked tirelessly over the past few years with staff to help train those who will continue her work, even delaying retirement to ensure a smooth transition. Whereas while her absence will be keenly felt by the South Carolina General Assembly, both bodies are grateful for her many years of service and dedication, she is devoted to the state, and the members wish her many years of happiness in her retirement. Now, therefore, it will be resolved by the Senate. House of Representatives concurring. The members of the General Assembly by this resolution congratulate Deborah Ann Duncan upon the occasion of her retirement. After more than four decades of outstanding service, wish her continued success and happiness in all her future endeavors. Resolution is adopted. President. Senator from Flores. President, thank you. I ask uh, Senate stand at ease for two minutes. Not objection. <laughs> Senator stand at ease for two minutes.
Senator Commodore, or Senator from Orangeburg, Senator Hutto, what purpose do you rise? Uh, to ask unanimous consent to take up uh, a magistrate's appointment in the box as well as a local bill school consolidation that's come back from the House with amendments. There's an objection. And none so ordered. Clerk will read. Allendale County delegation reported favorable on the appointment of an Allendale County magistrate, Mr. James A. White of Allendale. Question is confirmation. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Clerk will read. House is returned to the Senate with amendments S 771, bill by Senator Hutto. It's to consolidate Bamberg Earhart School Districts to one, also known as the Bamberg School District 1, and Denmark Ola School District 2, known as Bamberg District 2, and do one school district. Senator Marsburg, what purpose do you ride? I move to concur with the House amendments, and, um, and, and then I, I guess I move to invite. No, we we'll have to do that. Okay. All in, All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. It confirms in the House Amendment. Senator from Richland, Senator Scott, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, the announcement sent at the next available day that we adjourn in memory of Mr. Joe Sharp of Blythewood, South Carolina. The objection? Hearing none, so order. <laughs> Senator from Florence, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, to thank you. Uh, Ready for a conference report, if it... You recognize, sir. We uh, have a conference report for your consideration. <clears throat> a copy of it's on your desk this morning. And it's been on the internet since uh, Sunday, yesterday. But I have a few comments, Mr. President, and then we'll go to the conference report. <clears throat> Freddie, could we get some order in the chamber? Senate will come in order. You know, Senator many of you have uh, driven through the Blue Ridge Mountains on the parkway and you first enter those tunnels up there, it is dark. I mean, it is dark. You quickly turn on your car's headlights and proceed with caution. Eventually, you come out on the other side and return to the light. Because of your trip through the darkness, the return to light seems really more bright. You know, our fi past 15 months as a state fighting COVID-19 feels the same way. On March of 2020, we delayed our budget process and set in statewide session only when necessary. March 17th of last year, we passed H4014 and allocated $45 billion to DHEC for immediate needs. May 19th of last year, we passed H3411, a continuing resolution to keep our government going. Then we returned again on June 25th to pass H5202, the first distribution of federal funds from the CARES Act. On September 25th, we returned to Columbia to pass the second installment of the CARES Act. Just like that tunnel in the mountains in the Peeler, we spent plenty of time in the darkness. We were careful, we were prudent, we depended on our government and its essential public service ser uh, servants. We lost over 8,000 South Carolinians to this dreaded virus. But you know, we pulled together, Senator Mori, and uh, we are beating that COVID-19 finally at last. You know, this year's budget process feels like the moment when you leave the mountain tunnel and return to the light. I began serving as chairman of the Finance Committee in 2001. I've seen good spending plans with budget cuts. And you know, when you have budget cuts, you hurt our citizens. The budget your conferees present to you today 
is the single best budget I have seen as chairman of the Finance Committee. First, this budget invests in education. Included in the conference report is $1,000 salary increase per teacher for each teacher and also additional funds for 4K. Funding to expand the school resource officer program. Governor McMaster, this is one of his things during the campaign, and since he's been there, we have to do that to make sure that our children in those schools are protected. Second, this budget responds to the market for labor, provides some pay increases to our frontline public service, the DHEC, SLED, Department of Corrections, Department of Public Safety, Department of Juvenile Justice, Department of Probation, Parole, and Pardon, and the Department of Natural Resources. This is a theme you will see throughout the budget, in addition to the challenge in our public health. COVID-19 disrupted our labor markets, and we must respond to attract and retain the public servants who keep us safe. Third, I think it's ex extremely important this budget includes $200 million for the Ports Authority for expansion as global trade grows. I'm committed to paying cash for this necessary investment as surpluses allow. I really want to take this time to thank my fellow conferees, Senator Peeler, President Peeler, Senator Setzer, tremendous help, Chairman Smith, Representative Hayes, Representative Bannister, you know, our negotiations was fair because we knew that a budget conference committee is an exercise in compromise. Many people don't understand that, so you go in there and get what the Senate wants you to get. Well, Senator Peter, you go in there, you compromise. It's the only way you get a budget passed. So at this point in time, if Senator Peter has some comments, I'd ask him to come forth with those. All of my sense, Sessler, if he chooses to, Senator Peeler. What purpose do you rise, Senator Cherokee? Like You're recognized, Mr. President. Please give the President your attention. Mr. President, members of the Senate. Budget conference report is our state climbing out of the COVID-19 hole. I'll talk on the higher education highlights first, followed by the statewide funding issues, criminal justice funding, and constitutional funding. The Finance Committee staff is here to answer any detailed questions you may have. First, higher ed highlights. The higher education funding contained in this conference report is focused on access and affordability for in-state students. The conference report provides a $50 million reoccurring increase across the higher education system, including technical colleges. This will allow for tuition for in-state students not to be increased in the up upcoming year. We also fully fund all merit-based state scholarships with $318 million in lottery appropriations and provided over 100 million for scholarships, grants, and equipment for technical education. We appropriated a total of $60 million for need-based aid and 20 million for tuition grants to assist South Carolina students and families. The conference report provides an additional $371 million in one-time funding, $208 million for maintenance and other needed capital projects within the colleges and universities, and $163 million for one-time projects within the 16 tech schools. The Appropriations Bill and the Capital Reserve Fund, which passed earlier this year, will appropriate a total of $543 million for critical needs across our education system. While the General Assembly is providing an historic investment in higher education with the adoption of this conference report, our public colleges and universities must also do their part in keeping costs down for students 
and families. I'll borrow a phrase from Luke 12, 48, to whom much is given, much is required. Now statewide highlights. State employees. State employees receive a 2.5% pay increase with an appropriation of $59 million. For the state health plan, recurring dollars are provided to recover 100% of health and dental increases. No employee will see an increase in their monthly premiums. We're also addressing the unfunded liability and the retirement system. $32 million in it is included to fund the employer contribution. State aid to subdivisions. The aid to subdivisions formula is fully funded with a recurring increase of $17.9 million. In addition, the conference report includes a $10 million stabilization fund for those counties and municipalities who will lose funding due to population shifts with the new census figures. Criminal justice highlights. Over $19 million is provided to increase salaries for law enforcement officers. The money is to be used to retain officers at SLED, Department of Public Safety, Department of Corrections, Department of Juvenile Justice, Law Enforcement Training Council, and Department of Probation, Pardon, and Parole Services. A school resource officer will be in every school. In this conference report, the Department of Public Safety will be responsible for administering this program. The school resource officers will receive an additional $7 million, bringing their total appropriation to $19 million. We also provide law enforcement equipment such as vehicles, body cameras, and communication equipment for state agencies and various local law enforcement officer agencies. Department of, Veter of Veterans Affairs, $8 million to the Department of, Met of Veterans Affairs and non-recurring money will go to South Carolina Base Protection Fund in order to ensure that South Carolina's military installations remain strong. In addition to funding needed programs, the conference report sets aside $640 million in reserves we are saving for the future. Last summer, I created a reopened South Carolina committee chaired by the Senator from Oconee. Their charge was to work with agencies and communities to get South Carolina back open as soon as possible. This budget does that. The funds are included in this conference report to rebuild all our welcome centers, to renovate all our test areas, and to get litter off the primary and secondary roads. We want tourists to see our beautiful state. The budget shows them we are reopened and ready for business. I relinquish the podium to the Senator from Langston, Senator Sessler. Thank you. Yes, sir, the Senator from Lexington, you're recognized. Mr. President, I'll try not to duplicate much. There is some duplication in these reports. I chair the Natural Resources and Economic Development Subcommittee of Senate Finance, as well as serve on the K-12 Budget Subcommittee, which is chaired by the Senator from Dorchester. In the Natural Resources and Economic Development highlights, these agencies uh, did very well in meeting their recurring needs and to fulfill their primary needs next year. The Ports Authority, which we spent a great deal of time on the bond bill with the Ports Authority, uh, this budget gives a direct appropriation of $200 million to the Ports Authority for the infrastructure part, projects being the ICF. And at this point, there is no determination made about the balance whether there'll be bonds, or funds, cash, whatever that will be made at a later date. The Forestry Commission, uh, we gave money to give them more enclosed cab dozers, uh, which was their primary issue that they were interested in. The Department of Natural Resources, which has done without for many years, uh, they got 30 new uh, law enforcement officers plus overtime pay and step increases as well as money for their uh, relocation, the boat, the WMAs, and the fish hatchery. So DNR did very well in this budget. Uh, PRT, tourism, was one of the worst hit uh, industries in this state because of the pandemic. We gave $20 million in non-recurring funds to get tourists back into the state. 
uh, has been mentioned, welcome centers are funded. Those would be in North Augusta, Little River, Landrum, and Blacksburg, uh, the Huntington Island Lighthouse, Arsenal Hill, uh, and capital and deferred maintenance needs in the Department of Commerce, Commerce, and then the hopefully new Secretary of Commerce is in the ante room. Uh, got additional closing fund funds as well as locate SC money. The Department of Insurance through the MOU gets the fraud division uh, and it's funded there as well as SLED is given the five positions it needed to handle the fraud uh, division being at the Department of Insurance. First responders and firefighters got their first priority and that is the firefighter cancer benefit plan and PTSD treatment was funded. Clemson PSA and South Carolina State PSA are fully funded their extension efforts which was huge for both of them. In the K-12 public education highlights, uh, all teachers got a thousand dollar pay raise as a result of that, the starting salary for teachers will go from $35,000 to $36,000. And the $72 million in the teacher increase fully pays for it. And there is no local match on that $1,000 pay increase. It adds $65 million to the base student cost of the EFA, and it takes the uh, per pupil funding from 24.89 currently uh, to 25.16. And when you add in the teacher's uh, salary increase of $1,000, it takes that base student cost to 27.59. Additionally, which was a major priority of this South Carolina Senate, the $100 million non-recurring uh, appropriation to the capital funding for disadvantaged school districts uh, this budget maintains that $100 million that was funded in the South Carolina Senate. Four-year-old kindergarten is expanded statewide. Charter schools got about $35.9 million. Um, school resource officers have been mentioned. School resource officers uh, added uh, $7 million to the $12 million that's already there for a total of $19 million. The department has a carry forward of nine million and the funds are being transferred from the Department of Education to the Department of Public Safety uh, to deal with the school resource officers. Uh, you've been told about um, the 5% pay raise for bus drivers um, and it funds school nurses. And we have $93 million for instructional materials for the school. State employees get a two and a half percent pay raise and no increase in their uh, health insurance premium. In the Department of Social Services, the caring for South Carolina children is funded uh, and helps them towards their goal of uh, infrastructure integrity. In the Department of Mental Health, we funded their sustainability of workforce program uh, and help them in that arena. Uh, and the Department of Mental Health, we funded the uh, $49 million for two new facilities uh, for veterans, and there were one in Sumter and one in Ori County. Department of Health and Human Services, we funded, uh, put money under their maintenance of effort authorization in health and environmental control we funded their critical position retention at $2.7 million in their newborn screening program. Uh, disabilities and special needs, we funded their residential service rate up. Uh, we gave them an increase and gave them recurring monies. Uh, DEOTAS, we funded their sustainability of addiction crisis effort. In transportation, well, in the Office of Regulatory Staff, we funded the statewide broadband office and the 10 positions that it will take and gave them $10 million in non-recurring money to, fit, to go with the $30 million that's already been given to them to fully take forward the, the broadband extension. 
Department of Motor uh, Vehicles. We gave them money for uh, employee retention, which we talked about earlier. And in the Department of Transportation, we gave them a renovation of all the rest areas and $8 million in uh, funds for litter removal. And we put $50 million for the county transportation committees. Uh, so I think that covers the general areas that I was asked to cover. Uh, Mr. Chairman I, and members of the Senate, Mr. President, Chairman and members of the Senate, I would tell you that I thought all six conferees worked very well together and I thought they worked across the aisle and I thought they worked in good faith with each other. And uh, I think the budget that we have here shows that. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Darlington, what purpose do you have? See the Senator with you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Right. President. Thank you, Senator from Lexington. Um, and Mr. President, I would say this. I'm um, pleased, Senator from Lexington, that we extended and, and helped the four-year-old um, kindergarten. Right. Um, obviously, Mr. President was part of a big initiative in the beginning to end up um, having a big expansion at a time when we were dealing with Reed to succeed. And it looks like that we are following through on that initiative. I think that it was, um, it was something that was discussed then and took a long time and a lot of leadership to get to where we are now. So I want to thank him and also thank all of you all that were on finance to extend that. That was a, something that we had been wanting to do and needed for a period of time. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask, if you could, if you could further explain the $100 million for the disadvantaged schools. And so my understanding is, is that, is it true that this money is just appropriated, but we're gonna set forth some criteria that we're gonna put in the Department of Education. Is that, is that correct? Senator, the $100 million is put in a fund and the department is to present to us a plan for our consideration of how that money is allocated and on what basis, whether that be through legislative or what is yet to be, legislation or what that's yet to be determined. But yes, it's a, it's a so, group effort. So I just wanna make certain that, that what happened is, is that, and I just wanna make certain that we have fairness across the, across the board. So my understanding is, is that it goes to the Department of Ed, they're gonna end up setting forth the criteria. It comes back to us in a joint resolution of some sort. Yeah and that way that we'll get a chance to have a, another look at it because some schools have, have taken a, a, um, a deep dive and have already um, sort of put referendums together and, and end up paying for, for schools and others have not. They wanna make sure that there can be some fairness because you're trying to end up hitting those areas that are largely um, disadvantaged, largely rural, correct? That is correct. Okay, and so, and so it would come back through here and it has to pass both bodies. Is, it, is that how it's set up? That is my understanding of what the chairman of Senate Finance plans to do, Senator from Darlington. Okay, and, um, and um, was there any other specific, um, specific um, no, requirements and stuff in it, or, or that's gonna be left up to the, to the Department of Aid and then they'll come back directly Correct. to us? Correct. Okay, fair enough, thank you. Senator Florence, what purpose do you have? Senator from York, what purpose do you rise? I was going to ask if the Senator from Lexington would yield for a quick question as it relates to his portion of the conference report. Yes, here we go. Thank you, Senator. Um, in the PRT section, um, there is a sports marketing grant program funded in the amount of $2 million. Right. Are you, can you tell us what projects are going to be funded by that section? Senator, I, what I can tell you is there are two lines, if I recall correctly, in sports marketing, one is designated sports marketing, one is designated sports marketing grants. And what you're referring to is in the past, before the Senate passed its rule, that there was some uh, community improvements in, in that line. Uh, and I think that's what you're asking about. The Senate, if I recall, took $2 million out of that as we passed the appropriations bill, the House came back and took like another half million or a million, maybe a million out of it, which left two million. Uh, and that's, if I recall correctly, is recurring money. Uh, all I can tell you is that's what we know about that line, yes, sir. So, 
Just to clarify, it didn't originate in, in the Senate at no, the request sir. of a senator. No, sir. We it originated actually, in the House. We actually cut money on that line in the Senate. So and to the and that's Sen the reason it's down to $2 million. And, Senator, am I, am I right to conclude, to the best of your knowledge as a subcommittee chairman and a conferee, that you can't describe for us the manner in which that money will be spent? Well, that's true in a lot of lines in this appropriation, Senator, that we don't know the exact particulars of what that money is going to be used for. You understand, and I'm not defending it, so let me make that very clear, but there's lots of grants programs throughout this appropriations bill that have nothing to do with what you are referring to as earmarks and what I call community improvement projects. So all I can tell you is the South Carolina Senate, as far as I personally know, has complied with this rule and those community improvement projects have been disclosed. I can also tell you that it's my understanding, although I have not seen the list, that the House of Representatives has also provided a list uh, of, or a letter of some form of what theirs are. But there could, this could be a, there are, I can recall, I believe, in the sports marketing line, at one point there was a project, for example, I think, for the Citadel or some uh, dealing with sports, bringing a sports team to, to Charleston at one time. Yeah. Senator, in fact, I think I fought that one. Senator, were you aware last year a uh, million dollars of that money went to the South Carolina Aquarium and 1.5 went to the Riverbanks Zoo and Gardens, which the General Assembly and taxpayers could find out about ex post, not, well, I'll not be before very, we vote on the Senator, budget. Senator, you know, again, you, I don't know where you're trying to go. I can tell you what I know. I would vote for the aquarium in Charleston or the zoo in Columbia yeah. every day of the week Thank because you, they benefit all of South Carolina. Thank you. That is not a, anything except improving this state and tourism, economic development, in my opinion. And I'm only one voter here, but there's nothing sinister about funding those two in my mind. No, I, Senator, were you aware that I, I tend to agree? I mean, those are statewide okay. type priorities. I think the Senator, were you aware that the, my line of questioning was getting at the fact that, once again, we have another budget where there are significant amounts of money being spent and only a handful of staff, maybe a member of the House or two, know where the money's going to go? I don't think that's true, Senator, as to what this South Carolina Senate has done relative to requests of members of the Senate. I, I, I agree with you. Okay. Okay. Senator from Barnesburg, Senator Stevens, what purpose do you ride? Would the senator yield for a question, please? Sure. Senator, I... Uh, yes. <sighs> Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to give you this podium if you'd like it. <laughs> senator, yes, sir. A little heartburn every now and then when we talk about uh, public education and funding. Uh, under the uh, definition of disadvantaged uh, districts, would that be left up to the State Department or have the, uh, the General Assembly uh, defined some of the terms of disadvantaged districts? Senator, I would say exactly what the son from Darlington said. That is going to be recommended to us by the Department of Education for our consideration. The Chairman of the Senate Finance has indicated that he's going to do it openly in this body. So I think you will have an opportunity to have input into that. Okay, so there is no predetermined definition. That's what your question is, I think. Okay, and the other question of, of those districts that are presently, uh, and as mentioned by uh, Senator Malloy, there are some districts that are deep diving into uh, school funding uh, for uh, construction. If a, a district have passed a referendum, and that referendum uh, is taking place and it's all about uh, school uh, construction, would any of that $100 million uh, go towards that disadvantaged district? Senator, none of that has been determined. That's for the department to make a recommendation to us and for us to determine. Okay, so we, we do they, have a, 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 a dog in that fight. Right. In a sense. Okay, thank you, sir. I feel thank a little bit. You. I feel a little better now. I can.
rest of the Senator from committee. Dorchester, Senator Bennett, what purpose do you rise? A question. Yes. Uh, just a, a quick question, actually. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. I just wanted to come back to uh, Senator from Darlington's comments about that $100 million for the disadvantaged schools. Um, is it is it true, Senator, given the unprecedented budget cycle that we're in, the unprecedented times that we're in with federal funds coming, uh, that throughout this budget, but particularly with respect to education, would you agree, Senator, that there are a number of things in the budget that we will, um, be, for lack of a better term, pay, be paying particularly close attention to the implement, implementation of those funds because of the way that they may or may not interact with additional federal funds that are coming? That is exactly correct. So, Senator, un unlike many budget years where we put the budget and then we kind of move on to the next thing, uh, we'll probably be monitoring this budget much closer throughout the fiscal year than we probably have in the past. Would you would you agree with that comment? I don't, I don't think there's any question that we will be, Senator from Dorchester. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Senator from Anderson. Senator Cash, what purpose do you ride? I wish to be heard on the report. <laughs> Senator from Lexington, that's the quickest I've ever seen you go to your desk. <laughs> Senator from Anderson is recognized. Please give Senator Cash your attention. Of course, the budget is a large and complex uh, document, 40 pages by my count. I went through it pretty carefully this weekend. I was particularly interested in the part of the budget that is earmarks, because we're doing earmarks in a different way this year than we have in the past. I think it's a good change that we made when we changed the rule in the early part of the year. The rule which said that earmarks had to be identified uh, by what they were going to be used for, the amount requested, and the senator requesting the earmarks. So that's a step towards transparency. The uh, senator from Florence spoke about sunlight and the brightness of sunlight. I hope everybody here is in favor of politics and the sunshine. Uh, more transparency, the better certainly better for the taxpayer to be able to find out what's going on. We had some discussion about earmarks during the budget. Uh, I was a little bit in the middle of that. And uh, when this report came out this weekend and I started taking a look at it, I noticed that uh, of the four pages of earmarks from the Senate, only four of them had changed. I had to cross-reference it myself because the document wasn't available, but I went through it line by line. Four pages of Senate earmarks were requested. Only four were changed. All the rest that were requested were, shall we say, fully funded. There was two earmarks Senator, I'm not going to take questions right this minute, but when I get finished, I'll be happy to. There was two earmarks that were reduced. Uh, one for the Columbia Center, uh, Civic Center renovations, went from $19 million to $9 million. I asked the Senator from Richland about that to try to find out what the story was on that, and I don't see him in the chamber, but he indicated to me that there's some issue with a House member uh, affecting that earmark. The other earmark that got reduced was the Florence Crittenton House. Florence Crittenton House was an earmark requested by Senator Sin. Uh, it's located in downtown Charleston. Florence Crittenton has a mission to provide hope, safety, and opportunity to young women in order to instill self-worth and self-sufficiency. 
We value the right of every pregnant young woman to obtain the education, skills, and support needed to have a healthy start in life for both herself and her child. That's the mission of the Florence Crittenden House that Senator Sin requested $500,000 for. And after this conference committee, that request was reduced to $100,000. I don't know why. If I've got to compare the Florence Crittenden Center with all the other nonprofits in here that were fully funded as the earmarks requested, I'd be hard pressed to find how they're not as worthy of the money as the other nonprofits that got their full funding. So it does lead one to wonder why this request from Senator Sin, who's known to be independent and outspoken, was reduced from $500,000 to $100,000. I don't know, maybe Florence Crittenden House doesn't really need that much money. And so this reduction in their earmark uh, is not important. There was two earmarks, earmarks that were voted on by this Senate, earmarks that were contained in Amendment Number 84 on the third day of the budget session. Amendment number 84 is by Senator Leatherman with a number of other co-sponsors, including myself. There's 12 items in that amendment that were additional earmarks, if you're wondering what amendment number 84 was. There was 12 items on that list. Of those items, I had two. Senator Rice had one. One of my earmarks was approved for Dolly Cooper Park for $350,000. And one earmark for the Anderson Civic Center renovations went from a million five thousand dollars to a dollar. Senator Rice's earmark for the Pickens County Transportation Commission went from nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars to a dollar. Colleagues, I'm telling you, there was two earmarks that were reduced, and there were two that was cut altogether. So I want to talk about the earmark process. And I'm going to make some comments about it, and you're free to agree or disagree. As I said on the floor of the Senate when we were debating earmarks to start with, I can take it or leave it with earmarks. I don't see earmarks as a moral issue. It's a political issue. But I do believe if we're going to have earmarks, they have to be done in a certain way to make them fair to make them a part of the political process that's beneficial to all of our constituents. I believe there have to be certain principles involved in the earmark process, and I articulated those at the time, and I'm going to repeat them. I think earmarks ought to be transparent, and I applaud the Senate for taking the step, and I see in this document that also we now have a list of the house earmarks. And I think that's fantastic. I think it's the first step. It's not the only step, but it's the first step. And I will tell you, I don't think we can ever go back from that. Now that we've done it, I think we're gonna to have to continue to do it. We need to continue to do it so that it's clear who's requesting money for what purpose, what department that check's gonna be written through. The second principle that I think, in addition to transparency, is that earmarks need to be equitable. There's 46 Senate districts in this state. Is there one Senate district or two or five or 10 that are more important than the ones, than other ones? If we're gonna have, and we do have, on a regular basis, non-recurring revenue to divvy up in the earmarks process. Can anyone provide me an argument why that money should not be equitably distributed? Why there shouldn't be some process whereby, hey, 15 of you Republican senators over here didn't request any earmarks. That number may be a, a little bit off as a result of amendment number 84, but for those of you who didn't request any earmarks, your district's just left out on discretionary non-recurring revenue. Now, I wondered at the time we were having this discussion on the floor, and I'll wonder again today, 
why you don't request earmarks. And I can only conclude that you think there's something distasteful about the process, that somehow you think it might impinge upon your senatorial independence, and so you're just going to stay away from that. And that is, in fact, the third point I made about earmarks. If we are going to divide money in this state that's non-recurring, that's discretionary, that should be equitably distributed, it should be done without strings attached. You shouldn't have to sell a vote, and I'm not saying anybody does, but you shouldn't have to sacrifice your independence or wonder about how any votes you make on any particular issue might affect your ability to get an earmark. Senator Massey here is not a proponent of earmarks, and I, I understood his speech. I will note that Senator Rice and I both voted with Senator Massey on, on his uh, proviso to go back and redo that section of the budget. Because I do think the change is coming, and it has to change, and it needs to change. At the end of the day, I think I made it as clear as I could. But I don't think I have to agree to vote for the budget in order to get an earmark. And then my request for an earmark cannot be tied to my voting any particular way on any particular issue. And I can assure you it's not going to be but I'm not going to leave this issue alone either. There needs to be reform in the way that it's done. It's not equitable when one county gets a million dollars for body cameras and the other 45 counties get a million dollars combined to split up. Now, maybe you can explain that in some way, but I cannot. You know, there's a lot of things that get put in this document before we ever get to earmarks. We all know that. Line 1061 gives Florence County a million dollars for their civic center. Line 1062 gives Lexington County Convention Center a million dollars. Anderson County renovations get a dollar. Won't that be a nice picture of me presenting a check to Anderson County for a dollar? You may not know Senator from Oconee, but the Anderson County Civic Center is the emergency shelter should there ever be a problem with the nuclear station. And of that a million dollars, there's a hundred thousand of it going to be spent on a reliable generator. I'm going to vote against this report because I wanted to go back to the committee. There's no reason why Florence Crittenden shouldn't get the $500,000 that this Senate voted upon while the Anderson Civic Center shouldn't get a million and five thousand dollars, while the roads in Pickens County shouldn't get nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I'm talking about the process here, folks, the process of earmarks. That it's out of the bag now. Everybody knows who's asked for what. Everybody can and will study these numbers. And we've got to have some reform in how this thing works. And the first step of reform is we have to maintain senatorial independence. We cannot have and we cannot allow to have a situation where senators are rewarded or punished based on how they did or didn't vote a certain way by getting or not getting an earmark. We cannot allow that situation in the Senate and walk around and say, yeah, I'm a South Carolina senator and I vote according to my conscience. 
Senator, we got to change the process. You ready for questions yet, Senator? I will yield. Senator from question. Greenville, Senator Corbin, what purpose do you rise? Senator, yield for a question. I will. will. Senator, um, did you know that uh, I didn't have any earmarks in the budget? I had something put in the Senate version of the budget that was pretty important to me, though, and we all passed it. It was the Sunshine Proviso. And did you know, Senator, that that was taken out in conference? I did not know that. Uh, haven't had time to read the entire report. And as you know, it's, it's very hard to get into the details in two days to figure out what did or didn't pass. That's true, Senator, in the limited window of time that we have. But evidently, um, some House members didn't want transparency, from what I understand. But Senator, I find it, and you're speaking of transparency, that's why I rose to ask you the question. Um, because I think that above all is what the taxpayers want and what they deserve. And what the proviso that I had put in the budget was simply to expose or shed light on the hundreds of millions of dollars that are doled out to these nonprofits all across the state. And all we wanted to know was, who's in your nonprofit? You know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what are you doing with the taxpayer dollar? But that got stripped out, which was disappointing. And I find it, did you know, Senator, it's going to be very difficult for me to vote for this conference committee report with the transparency piece not in place. Did you know, Senator, that I can't really ask you a question, but I'll just say this. You're talking about nonprofits who are receiving state taxpayer money, and you're talking about transparency and accountability on their behalf. So if in fact, we're going to give money to nonprofits as part of our earmark process or budget process. We at least have some idea, and the taxpayer, if they want to know, has some idea. Hey, are there people on that board who are relatives of representatives or senators? Are there people of, you know, working for that organization who are business associates of the people who are voting to give them money? I mean, those are real legitimate questions. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to agree. I'm just going to state it as a fact. It's a fact that if we're voting to give money to our friends and business associates, at the very least, the public has a right to know about it if they're willing to read a report. I believe that's what the amendment was about, and I was very pleased that you were willing to offer it. You know, I've been here in my fourth year, and some of the things that go on here, it just gets into the, into the frame of mind and into the mindset, well, that's the way it's always been done. That's the way we're going to always do it. Why bother? But we took a step this year. We made a rule change towards transparency by disclosing earmarks. But we're not all the way to the finish line. Because we don't have equitability in the way that the state's money is distributed. We don't. Earmarks. We don't have independence on earmarks when you're expected to vote a certain way in order to protect your ability to get an earmark. We don't have independence. And we can say that's the way we do the budget. Well, I'm here to say we should figure out another way to do it. I doubt that I'm the one to figure out the better way to do it, but there's some of y'all who've been here a long time who have the experience who probably could help with this process, and I'm asking for your help. It's time for change. We've begun change. We've got to continue change. Now, someone's going to stand up and say, we've got to pass this budget or, or else the state will run out of money and... And, 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 and what? That's, we can vote against this and send it by the committee and they can change it in a day or two. And then we can vote it in. That's what I'm asking you to do. Three earmarks. One got reduced, two got, two got cut altogether because apparently we're too independent. We vote the way we feel like we should vote. And if that doesn't line up with somebody else's opinion of how we should vote, then by golly, you won't get your earmark. And you'll learn your lesson. And look, everybody can see this document. 
The lesson's been put out there for all y'all to learn, but you already know the lesson. I haven't learned the lesson. I don't intend to learn the lesson. As a body, we need to change the way that this is done. Mr. Chairman, at the appropriate time, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote. Thank you. Senator from Pickens, Senator Rice, what purpose do you have? I ask that the words from the senator from Anderson's uh, be put, uh, his words be put in the journal, please. Objection. Any none so ordered. Senator from Lexington, what purpose do you have? Mr. Chairman, is Senator for Finance here? Do you know where he is? Here he is. Senator from Florence. Please give Senator from Florence your attention. Appreciate the opportunity to address the Senate on this. I want to respond to uh, some of the remarks that Senator Cash made. First of all, many of you have served on conference committees. Many of you around this chamber. The uh, conference committee takes two votes on each side to keep something in. Try as we uh, may, try as we must to protect the Senate position. We could not get two votes on the House side. So when you talk about uh, why they came out, that's the only thing I can tell you. You've got to have two votes on each side. That's the way the conference committee works. So I guess what we got is what we got, right? That's the system. Senator Florence. In the, uh, Member of the Senate has a question on specific items. Our staff's here right outside. Some are on the floor. Go to them. They will respond to you, answer any question you have. And uh, we'll see whether we have members have a question. We hope you do. But if you do, you'll, they will be answered. So with that, Mr. President, uh, I'd move the adoption of the conference report as presented to the Senate. Senator from your, Senator from your, Senator Clymer, what purpose do you rise? I'd like to be heard on the conference report. You're relinquishing the floor, Senator. He'd like to be heard. Are you relinquishing the floor? Are you stepping away from the desk, sir, to allow the Senator from York? Sure. Senator from York, recognized. Please get the Senator from Pionk your attention. Senator Clymer. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, members of the Senate, I want to spend a little time kind of following up on Senator from Anderson's commentary around earmarks, but, but return more specifically to the uh, back and forth the Senator from Lexington and I had earlier around the sports marketing grant program. But to begin, I, I first want to uh, compliment the leadership and staff of the Senate Finance Committee for giving us this list. I've been here five years. It's the first time we've ever had one of these lists. To the best of my knowledge, uh, this is the most transparency we've ever had in a budget as it relates to where the money is going to go for specific local projects. And again, I, I want to reiterate my compliments to you. I think uh, the Senator from Florence and, and his ABLE team did their absolute best to comply with both the letter and the spirit of the anti hidden earmark rule that the Senate adopted on the first day of session this year. And despite all of their good effort, I still think we have hidden earmarks in this budget. And specifically, I think, well, I think beyond a, any reasonable doubt, there are hidden earmarks in the PRT section dealing with sports marketing grants. Uh, the governor in, in the executive budget 
requested that that line be zeroed out. So it went from six and a half million last year to zero. As the senator from Lexington described earlier, it changed from zero in the governor's budget, the agency budget, to four and a half million, excuse me, to negative four and a half million in the house, leaving two million in. And so I went back through and found Department of Administration reports in prior years on where this money went in the sports marketing grant program. It is pure, straight, earmarked money, period. And we all know the way it works, either through <laughs> participation in the process or having read about it in the state and the Post and Courier, is with these, with these line items, when they leave the General Assembly, the, mud, the money gets to the agency, the chairman of Ways and Means in this case, not the chairman of finance this year, he's been transparent, but the chairman of Ways and Means or a member of his staff will call over to PRT and say, hey, you know that $2 million we got for sports marketing grant program? Yep, 250 goes here, 150 goes there, 750 goes there, so on and so forth. That's how this line item has worked in practice year after year after year after year. And I'd be willing to lay down a large bet that that's how it's going to work this year too. And, and one of the things that I find most concerning about this is included in this list of projects we got that were initiated at the request of a legislator. And we got all the Senate projects in here, got a number of House projects in here, I didn't add them all up, but it's, it's a whole lot of projects. I mean, this is a, a table with a lot of lines on it. And I'm curious if they were willing to disclose all of those. What's so special, perhaps nefarious, about the things they're not disclosing in this sports marketing grant line? And I think... As a, as a matter of public policy, to the senator from Anderson's earlier point, and in keeping with the policy position that the Senate took on the first day of session this year when it adopted an anti-hidden earmark rule, we as a, as a body, as a General Assembly, need to have a little bit more conversation around what we mean when we say hidden earmarks. And I want to engage in a little back and forth for a minute, but I'm, I'm tempted to raise another point of order because this, and I, I raised it the first round when we were on the floor um, debating the budget in, I don't know, a couple, couple weeks ago. Um, but this time I've come with paper evidence and I think I can substantiate that point of order, but if the Senator from Edgefield. Senator from Edgefield, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, I want to see if the Senator from York yield for a few questions. You will. will. Senator, did you know that when we were um, discussing adding this rule, um, before we got to the floor, as we were trying, as we were drafting rules for the new legislative session, and we had some conversation about some changes and then some additions, like this one, that there were a number of people, a number of senators who expressed concern about yeah. making this rule change. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Um, some folks may not have wanted done it publicly, but there were some people who didn't like it. You understand that, don't you? Yeah. Um, one of those concerns was that if we're required to disclose these things and say the governor can see them now, that maybe they will be subject to attack. The veto pen. Veto. Yeah. Is that right? Or, or uh, just public accountability. Or public, that's right. Attack from multiple fronts. Um, but, and, and there were other, there were other, um, other criticisms, other, uh, arguments made as to why maybe we shouldn't do this. You, you were privy to a lot of those, right. heard, yeah. heard a lot of, he heard a lot of it. You heard a lot for, of it for, for a number of years as we kept trying to do this, make this change. And, um, and, it, and it's, but, but we did it. Um, and ultimately we had support on the floor, but, uh, but there were still some folks who were uneasy about it got a good persuasive rules committee chairman yeah that's what it was um but um but did you know I, I think that the people in the senate 
the members of the Senate who accepted this rule and who agreed to disclose every funding request, community improvement project request, earmark request, how, what, however you want to call those things, the people in the Senate on both sides here who have agreed to do this ought to be particularly outraged at the House's refusal to do it. I think that's absolutely right. And to your point, one of your points, that the House, despite having a rule for years to this effect, you, you were aware of that, right? The House has had a rule, so they just never comply with it, right? right? Um, despite having that rule and never complying with it, this year they did disclose a number of things, as you pointed out, right? Almost it's, certainly because... To, to, their, to their credit, right? To, I mean, and, to, to their credit. And, and effort was made. Almost certainly because there's been a, a significant amount of pressure put on them to make those disclosures, right? right? Um, but disclosing th some things while obviously refusing to disclose other things, that has to make you suspicious about what's in the other things, doesn't it? It, it invites question, skepticism, and, and concern. You, and when you've got the Senate... And a number of folks who didn't like this new rule, but have accepted it, maybe forcefully, but they've had to accept it. When they've had to accept it and disclose certain things and put themselves out there, the fact that the House can get away with not disclosing everything seems to me, wouldn't you agree, that ought to upset everybody in here. Yep. And it certainly runs afoul of the public comments made by leadership in the House of Representatives. And so you're going to have people in here who submitted earmark requests who are going to be criticized for them, some of them, won't they? Sure, yeah. You will have some who have earmark requests that are identified and called out in the newspapers, won't they? You will have some earmark requests that get targeted um, for vetoes, won't they? But by allowing the House to continue with that process, we're allowing them to fly under the radar with no sense of scrutiny whatsoever. And the taxpayers don't know, members of the General Assembly don't know, um, and there's been a lot of public reporting over the last six, eight months around uh, legislators sending money to nonprofits and other um, entities with which they are very intimately associated. And given the fact that so many earmarks are disclosed and the fact that this two million is not, it really leads me to question where that money is going to go and why it was hidden. Yeah, the, the fact that you disclose many things but don't disclose everything really makes the antennas quiver as, as, as far as why you, what's in that that you don't want everybody to know what it is until it's too late. That's right. Doesn't it? Um, Senator, you, I mean, you agree, I think. We, we, the Senate took a significant step in adopting the rule change for this year and requiring this disclosure. Yes, sir, not, not only adopting it, but, but to the best of my knowledge, honoring both the letter and the spirit of it with the activity that took place in the Senate. And, and that was gonna be my next, my next point, is that by, from everything that we can determine, Senate finance staff, in as much good faith as possible, tried, tried to disclose everything, tried to find information as best they could to gather the information from the House and then disclose that to us, didn't they? That's right, yeah. Right, so you have no reason to believe, I don't, um, you have no reason to believe that Senate's finance has done anything other than be completely forthright with us. That's right, and, I, and I'll tell you, I took time and looked. I, I studied and read it, and I couldn't find anything that led me to question what happened uh, in the Senate budget process that was as apparent, just as obvious, as this sports marketing grant program that has emanated from the other chamber of the General Assembly. Well, and, and, and you pick on sports marketing tourism grants because, and you may have said this earlier, but historically that has always been a line oh, yeah. where you've had earmarks rolled up into it. Legislators been on the record in newspapers uh, saying that they've been doing it for years. And I you know, have some transparency reports from the Department of Administration that, that give evidence of that practice. Right, so Senator, how do, we, how do we get the House to play fair? 
How do we get the house to disclose everything? Because because I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. This is a concern that I had earlier. It's a concern that led to the, the, the rules change. But I'm concerned about requiring senators to vote on a budget when they're being specifically told there's stuff in here. You know it's there. We're showing it to you, but we're not going to tell you what it's for. How do we address that? I think we've got a couple options at this point. Um, one would be to seek to prevail upon the governor to veto that section, as he, I believe he has in the past. Um, and in fact, his, his own budget request specifically cited this section as one that is habitually abused, so my, I assume that the governor probably would veto it. Another thing we could do, which again gets back to my comment earlier about having a little bit more conversation around this, is we can raise the point of order again, see what happens from the, the vantage point of, of the chair and the advice that the chair receives. Uh, and then depending on the outcome of that ruling, the Senate can have a conversation and vote on what it means with that rule. Senator, did you know, I think to, to your first point, um, I mean, I would hope that the comments that the governor has made about disfavoring these hidden earmarks Hopefully, he will um, ensure some accountability to the House budgeting process, um, because it seems to me that the very fact that you're unwilling to disclose them is sufficient reason to veto. It is. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. So even to to the senator from Lexington's point earlier about the aquarium or the zoo, if those things are specifically identified and the amount is identified along with the earmark requests, those are things that would get, get a lot of support in this body, wouldn't they? Which, again, begs the question, why would they not be why disclosed not disclose, on the front end? Why not disclose these? And so at this point, where we are in this stage, well, one of our only options would be, hopefully, that the governor would insist on what he said in the past, and that is veto right. this particular line item, mm -hmm. right? And, and then 16 of us would need to vote to sustain the veto. Well, and then what's going to happen is that the House will summarily override the veto. Right. Um, but the only way to change the behavior is to force it, so then you're going to have to get one-third plus one of the Senate voting to sustain that veto, right. aren't you? Yeah. Right. The other, the other issue you brought up, another way to address it, and I know you and I have had some conversations about a point of order, it seems to me, Senator, that perhaps the better, the better move would be um, while we have, and the Senator from Anderson talked about this a little bit, and that is we've taken a big step here. Yeah. But it's clearly not the final step, right? I agree. We've got to go further than where we, where we are right now, don't we? Apparently so. I thought we had, I yeah. thought we had gotten there, and, and here it is again. And so maybe, maybe we really need to have a serious conversation about tightening this rule even more. I mean, well, if, if the rule doesn't um, accomplish the spirit of what we're after, then the rule obviously needs to be improved. And, and this is something, did, did you know, in some of the conversations I had with Senator from Richland last year and even early part of this year coming into this, and I don't want to steal any of his thunder, but... Um, but one of the whole, I guess the biggest hole in the rule that we knew was a potential was what if the House just doesn't disclose? And then despite Senate Finance's best efforts at discovering those projects, if the House just refuses to tell us. Right. Uh, then, and the Senator from Richland asked me about this a number of times, how do we get that disclosed? Right, that we knew that that was a potential hole in the rule, that maybe we've got to come up with something um, even stronger to try to encourage the House to do the right thing. And I forgot one. We could vote down the conference report. Well, that's, that's an option as well. Uh, that, and that if the message then gets delivered back to the House conferees, this conference report almost certainly would have been approved but for you're intentionally failing to tell us what you're spending this money on. Show the taxpayers the list. Right, just show us what you just show us what you're asking for. Yeah. Right. So there are a few options <laughs> left. Uh, 
we've made, you agree, we've made significant progress from where we were oh. the last time we went through this process. We haven't had, this is the first year we've ever had this list, to the best of my knowledge. And I, and I regret that it's not complete, but it would be unfair to say that's not real progress. Absolutely. And it does appear to be complete from the Senate requested. <clears throat> to the best progress. of my knowledge. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, well, Senator, I'm glad that you and I have had the conversation because I think we've identified at least a few steps that we can take, um, whether that's voting down the conference report or having the governor veto this line item and, and then maybe us sustaining it and not sending the message over to the House or maybe trying something much more severe with the rule yeah. um, to basically say that the Senate couldn't adopt a conference report if there are hidden earmarks that's right. in there. Yeah, ta the taxpayers deserve nothing less than complete transparency on the nature of the, their tax dollars and how they're being spent. Taxpayers deserve nothing less, but senators, the taxpayers' elected representatives, deserve nothing less as well, right? right. Because we're the ones being, being asked to cast a vote. We should at least have an idea. Or, or, or if we ask the pointed question, what is this, we ought to be able to get the answer. Oh, I, and, and Senator, uh, for... for for the benefit of the body, I've gone to a lot of people right. asking, where's this money going? Nobody around here can tell me. And it's not for their lack of trying. They've tried. Right. The House won't tell them. Right, exactly. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Mr. President, I... Senator from Richland. Senator Arpo. Senator, yield to a question. I would. Two. He will. Uh, Senator, you're aware that, um, well, I take no credit for the transparency. My first year in the Senate, I was uh, somewhat amazed by the lack of transparency in the budget process. We, we will give you some of the credit. Uh, just, just, at least just, a smidge. Just, a smidge, <laughs> thank you. Um, and as a result, you remember that I served Freedom of Information requests on 12 different executive agencies. Do you remember yeah. me doing that? I do. And out of that came disclosures about much of what the newspapers have written about, uh, that House members had uh, family foundations, they had uh, in-laws that had nonprofits, that they were laundering money, state money, into their private concerns. Do you remember that? I do, and it's a, uh, just an astounding and uh, unacceptable practice. And what we see, and, and let me also say this, uh, Senate Chairman of Senate Finance understood the issue agreed with the issue, agreed with the position, and has agreed with what we're doing in this chamber, which right. is total transparency um, as, to the as to the budget process. I hope next year to be able to talk about total transparency with the Department of Commerce, but that's another argument <laughs> for another day. That's right. Um, but it seems to me this there's a very simple solution to this, and that is that we ask the governor, we ask the governor individually to veto the, their executive agency budgets, where they've hidden things, apparently, um, and sustain his veto. That will deny them, that is, those members of the House who are still attempting to secret money to friends and, and relatives. And two, um, it will put the governor in a position to have to put up or shut up. Now, if in fact, is that somebody laughing at me saying, put up or shut up? <laughs> probably an impossibility, <laughs> but, but, and number two, I promise you that I will serve those same FOI requests oh, yeah. come October, once the checks are written. So those agencies, the, the governor should tell those agencies, they're under him, don't write the checks. The House of Representatives has no authority to call over and tell you how that money was to be spent. You know, and it, in my opinion, it's illegal for them to do that. I, you know, Senator, I'm, I'm not allowed to ask you a question, but I can state that I would be curious to know whether perhaps, you know, your, far, your firm might send out more FOIs than any other law firm in this state. Because every time I, every time I pick up the newspaper, you have FOI'd some, some, some new document. Some, <laughs> Senator, with all due respect, some of those done at your urging, okay? <laughs> hey, 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 I have good counsel. I, I, I love the Freedom of Information Law. I love it. I love it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. The question is, adoption of the conference committee report, roll call as required. Clerk will ring the bell.
Meeting clerk will call the roll. Mr. Adams. At voting, Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Allen. Aye. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mr. Campson. Aye. Mr. Cash. No. Mr. Clymer. No. Mr. Corbin. No. Mr. Cromer. Aye. Mr. Davis. Aye. Mr. Fanning. Aye. Mr. Gambrell. Aye. Mr. Garrett. At voting, Mr. Goldfinch. Aye. Mr. Grooms. Aye. Mrs. Gustafson. Aye. Mr. Harpootlian. Aye. Mr. Hembry. Aye. Mr. Hutto. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Kevin Johnson. Aye. Mr. Michael Johnson has leave. Mr. Kimbrell. At voting, Mr. Kempson. Aye. Mr. Leatherman. Aye. Mr. Loftus. Mr. Loftus votes aye. Mr. Malloy. Aye. Mr. Martin. Aye. Mr. Massey. No. Mrs. Matthews. Aye. Mr. McElveen. Aye. Mr. McLeod. Aye. Mr. Peeler. Aye. Aye. Mr. Rankin. Aye. Mr. Rice. No. Mr. Sam. Aye. Mr. Scott votes aye. Mrs. Sin has leave. Mr. Setzler. Aye. Mrs. Sheely. Aye. Mr. Stevens. Aye. Mr. Talley. Aye. Mr. Turner. Aye. Mr. Verdon. Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. <coughs> Mr. Williams votes aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Young votes aye. Five cents have voted. Mm. Senator Spartanburg, Senator Kimball votes aye. Senator from Greenwood. Senator, Senator Garrett votes aye. Senator from Berkeley. Senator Adams votes aye. All senators have voted. Polls will close. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 39 to 5, the conference committee report is adopted. Clerk will read. Message from the House. Mr. President, members of the Senate, House respectfully informs your honorable body. It's adopted the report of the Committee of Conference on H4100. This is a bill to make appropriations to provide revenue to meet the ordinary expenses of state government fiscal year July 1. 2021. Received his information. Senator from Oconee. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, unanimous consent to distribute some information regarding an update um, by the South, on the South Carolina Behavioral Health 2021 Progress Report that's done by the Institute of Medicine and Public Health and the South Carolina Behavioral Health Coalition. Uh, this executive summary, but then also you'll be receiving something in the mail as well. Objection? Being none so ordered. Senator from Medgefield, Senator Massey, what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, to make a quick announcement. Um, Mr. President, um, I want to let, I think we're pretty much finished with everything we needed to accomplish today, everything we could accomplish today. So if anybody has any unanimous consent requests, um, Please jump up, but but I'll say this, Mr. President. Under the signing die resolution, we would be returning next Tuesday, the 29th, to address any gubernatorial vetoes related to the conference report. Um, and and I think, the, Mr. President, you'll be sending out notification to us exactly what time that'll be on the 29th. But everyone should plan to be back on the 29th, and hopefully that'll that'll wrap us up for for a few months. So. Um, Mr. Mr. President, if there are no unanimous consent requests, I move that the Senate adjourn pursuant to the signing die resolution. Senator from Edgefield moves that the Senate do not adjourn subject to the signing die resolution. All in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. And it stands adjourned. Thank you, Shane. All his buddies went to Myrtle Beach and got COVID. Oh, I remember.